Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly, affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another and do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so, you will keep coals of fire on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. As we said last week in chapter 12, this is where the Apostle Paul begins to tell the church how they are to apply all of the teachings we have heard so far in chapters 1 through 11. As Christians, this is how we are to live. Instead of being conformed to the world, instead of living just like everybody else lives, we are called to be different. We have a higher calling than the world, so let's live in light of that. Amen? Our love, verse 9, Paul writes, should be without hypocrisy. Now turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. We're going to take a look at Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 32. The King James Version translates Romans 12 this way. Let love be without dissimulation. Uh, Meaning, love should not be shallow. It should not be hollow. It should not be empty. It should not be fake. It should not be hypocritical. Rather, love should be sincere. Jesus said in Luke 6, 32, take a look. He said, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. How many of us do that? (laughs) Love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. So what is the scripture telling us here? That the love that comes only from God, true love, is selfless. It is selfless. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13 that love does not seek its own. And really, this stands in stark contrast to the world's concept of love, which is basically more or less just an emotion. You know, it's something that makes us feel good. And after all, it's all about how we feel, right? So if you're not feeling it anymore, if you're not feeling the love, if someone is no longer a benefit to you, what does the world say? Well, forget them. You can discard that person. Well, that's not what the scripture teaches. Turn back to Romans chapter 12. So that's the way the world looks at it. Love is just a feeling. You have it or you don't. That's not what the Bible says, though. Our love should be without hypocrisy. It should be sincere. Paul writes, abhor 
what is evil. That is a strong word. Abhor what is evil, but cling to what is good. Be kindly, affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Let's face it, putting other people first it doesn't come naturally to most people. I know you probably wouldn't want to admit that, but it's the type of thing that you really have to work at. It doesn't come naturally to the average person. So uh, we know that the Ten Commandments tell us how we are to live. If you lived in Israel under the Old Covenant, the commandments is what people look to. And we understand that the Ten Commandments, most of us understand that uh, they were broken up into two parts, right? The first half of the commandment spoke of how we are to uh, deal in our relationship with God. The second half of the commandments deal with our personal relationships with others. So our responsibility to God and our responsibility to others. So Romans 12 really answers the question of how should we then live? Because under the new covenant, we don't necessarily look to the commandments. But Jesus summarized the commandments by saying, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So if you read the commandments, most of them are phrased in a negative fashion, right? Thou shalt not. And that's typically how we think of the commandments. So think of Romans 12 as the commandments, in a sense, applied in a positive way. Uh, thou shall cling to what is good. Thou shall be kind to one another. Thou shall be given to hospitality. Thou shall live in peace with all men. So Romans 12 basically is an overview of Christian behavior. As I said last week, uh, Paul did not give us 11 chapters of doctrine so that we would know everything and do nothing. We need to be applying this to our lives. So with doctrine, you always have to look for the application, right? Because if you're not applying it, what good is it? Yes, it is truth. But if truth is not put into action, if we don't practice what we preach, then we've missed the whole point. When reading the Bible, you should always pray. Every time you open the Bible, every time you read, you should ask God, you should pray, Lord, show me how I can apply this to my life. How can I apply this in my relationship to God? How can I apply this in my relationship towards other people? And when you study the Bible, we all should be studying the scripture. We ask those basic questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. How does this apply to me? And I know there's people that will read and they'll read a story in the scripture and they say, you know, this isn't relevant. How does this apply to my life? And they have those thoughts, but I promise you, Okay, I promise you, if you spend the time reading, spend the time in prayer, there is an application. There's always an application. So we need to ask those questions. How do I apply this to my life? How should I live? Verse 11, take a look. Do not be lagging in diligence. Rather, we should be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So when we serve, we should be passionate. We should be committed. We should be energized. And it is a real easy thing to kind of get a little too laid back in your service. You know, cut a few corners or maybe compromise a little bit. It's a, it's a tempting thing and we could all fall into that. We might even become complacent. And I really believe when that starts to happen in a person's life, God will send an individual or a situation into that person's life to get their attention. Now, the only question is, not is God going to do that? I believe he does it. The question is, how do we respond? And of course, that's the issue with the application. Uh, God's doing his part. Are we doing our part? And this is often how it happens. I think we understand this. You know this. Sometimes someone will start out and man, they are on fire for the Lord. How many of you know someone that's on fire for God? Well, I hope you say, well, I am, right? I am. Someone, they're on fire for God. They're excited, then they kind of cool off 
a little bit. They're still committed, but they just cooled off. And then they start to cool off a little bit more. And then they sort of feel like they're just stuck in a rut. You know, they're not backslidden necessarily, but they're not really moving forward. And I think it is true if you're not moving forward, you are kind of moving backwards. And that's a real danger because even if you feel like, okay, I'm not backslidden, I'm not moving, I'm just stuck in that rut. Yeah, but what's the next step? It's just being backslidden. So this is a real danger. And let me tell you, if that describes anyone here, for goodness sakes, do something about it. Do something about it. Respond. Respond. Get some of that fire back. We need some of that fire back here at Morris Corner Church. We really, really do. I think sometimes people sit around, and I've probably been guilty of this, where you're sitting and you're waiting for God to do it for you. You're sort of waiting for God to kind of send down that zap to change the way you feel. I don't know that you should be waiting for that. Get up, do what's right, serve God, press on. That's what we need to do. How do I do that? How do I apply that? Well, maybe a little repentance is in order. If your Bible reading is down to, say, Bible reading is pr and prayer is down to 20 minutes a day, hey, kick it up to 40. If it's down to 40, kick it up to 80. Now, at some point, you're going to burn yourself out. So you don't keep going and going and going. Uh, but let's say uh, weekly attendance has turned into bi-weekly attendance. And then monthly attendance. Well, listen, the, the solution is fairly obvious. And to the person who says, you know, I'm already doing all those things. I'm doing all the things right. And I still don't feel like I'm moving forward. You know, and this is when sometimes we're tempted to blame others or we're tempted to blame the church or you say, well, you know, I'm just not being fed. I'm just not being fed. And listen, that does happen sometimes. But before we point the finger out there, we need to make sure the problem isn't in here. So many of those who feel like they have stagnated, uh, it's because they're not getting victory in their life. We need to start getting the victory in our life. There's a certain sin, maybe, some temptation, some behavior that we're not dealing with. We know we should, but for whatever reason, we don't. And that eventually turns into acceptance. You know, it's like the hymn, just as I am. Well, it's just the way I am. That's just the way it is. And you know what? It's been so long, I don't know if I'll ever be able to change. You know what? Victory feels a whole lot better than surrender, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So it does take diligence. It does take uh, a fervent spirit. But it's true what they say. And I, listen, I know this is a cliche, but it's true. No pain, no gain. Isn't, doesn't that apply to so many different things? So, hey, put in the effort. And besides, what does the Bible say? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we get the victory? Yes, we can. Praise God. Verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Now, if we believe the promises of God, there is no reason to not rejoice. We have every reason to rejoice. I know we hear bad news. We hear the stories of someone sick or maybe you're sick. Someone you love is sick. You know what? We have every reason to rejoice. We really do. Why? Because we're going to heaven. Just think about that. I am going to heaven. Amen. That just kind of puts a whole new light on everything. That's how it's possible to be patient in tribulation. That's how it's possible to be in the worst of all circumstances. Like Paul, you know, he's in prison and what's he doing? He, he's singing. He's rejoicing. How is that possible? Because he's on his way to heaven. The worst thing they could do to Paul was kill him. Worst thing they can do to you is kill you. We don't want that to happen. But worst case scenario, we're with the Lord. We are going to heaven. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? We have better days ahead, a whole eternity of better days, in fact. Continuing steadfastly in prayer, verse 13, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Uh, every Christmas, we hear about Jesus' words, how it is more blessed to give than to receive. And uh, that's true the rest of the year, by the way. 
Uh, it always makes me laugh when people say, you know, it's Christmas time, it's the holidays. We really should be nicer to one another around the holidays. That is not a Christian attitude. It's not a Christian attitude. The Christian attitude is, hey, be nice all year round, right? Uh, so distributing to the needs of the saints, yeah, give. If you can give something, give it. Verse 13 says we should be given to hospitality. Now, given to hospitality is literally translated pursuing the love of strangers. It doesn't just refer to welcoming and entertaining family and friends. You know, the people we like and we're comfortable with, you know, we'll do that with them, but not, not other people. That's, that's not what he's saying. Pursuing the love of strangers. So we should reach out and be kind to people. And yeah, even people we don't know. And even people we don't like, but we'll get to that in a moment. But that's what Jesus said. Remember, if we only love those who love us, what reward do we have for that? Well, the answer is none. We have no reward. Jesus said, do not even the tax collectors and the sinners do the same. The worst person on earth, even he's nice to the people who are nice to him. It doesn't say anything. Uh, now, in biblical times, when people go on a journey, uh, they go from place to place. There was no real guarantee of safe travel and lodging. You know, strangers going through the land, they had no assurance they were going to be treated well. We can just call the police or call AAA if we're on the side of the road. You know, they didn't have that. They really relied on uh, the kindness of strangers. So if somebody was traveling, they didn't have uh, food or they ran out, they didn't have a place a uh, roof over their head for the night. Even for a believer, giving them a loaf of bread and letting them sleep in their barn, even that was a blessing. That doesn't sound like much of a, a gift today. But obviously things were different back then. Uh, so they had no restaurants, no hotels. They really depended on the kindness of strangers. But really, we still depend on the kindness of strangers today. Yeah, some of the details have changed. And let's face it, we're strangers to people. We need to be kind to people. It, it goes both ways. But think about those times, you know, where your car broke down. Who's had a flat tire in this room? Everybody, right? You've broken down. This is before cell phones. So some of you who are a little younger, you haven't experienced this. But, you know, I have, you're broken down on the side of the road. Maybe it's at nighttime. There's one time, actually, we did have a cell phone and it was out in the middle of nowhere at night. Of course, it was raining, got a flat tire. We had to walk and we would have been walking all night. But you know what? A, a nice, kind person. Uh, I don't know. They heard us. We were talking, me and my daughter on the road, we're talking, walking down the road and they heard us out their window and they gave us a ride. And I thank God for that person. But you can be that person. You can do something uh, to help someone else out. That's what, we, that's what we should do. We should always be ready to show kindness to others. And yes, and this is the hard part, even showing kindness to those people we don't like. You say, well, I love everybody. Yeah, okay, sure, sure you do. <laughs> Verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Now, we remember what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you. And it is generally understood that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is showing people the perfect way. But at the same time, he is showing them what the law requires. And basically, it's a standard that nobody can keep. But that doesn't give us an excuse to disregard or disobey. So why should we love our enemies? Well, it's very simple, because when you were an enemy of God, he demonstrated his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God did that to us. We ought to do that to others. Now, when Jesus and Paul talk about bless those who curse you, bless those who persecute you, this does not mean bless as in asking for God to bless their bad behavior. That's not what we're asking for. It's not the same as asking for God's blessing in the sense of God, please 
uh, bestow your favor upon this individual uh, based on what they're doing. That's not really the point. Bless in this context simply means for your enemies, those who don't like you, those who hate you, you should not speak evil of them. You should be kind to them. Now, you could treat them the way they're treating you, but you're just as bad as they are at that point, right? So that's not the Christian response. Love your enemies does not mean have a warm, fuzzy feeling about them because that's probably not going to happen. And again, love isn't just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Feeling. Love should be put into action. So love your enemies means we desire the greatest good for them. If you have an unsaved person who is your personal enemy, what should you desire? Well, you want to see them saved, right? Because if they're born again, that's going to hopefully change everything. Hopefully. Now, if your personal enemy is a fellow believer in Christ, okay, that's... That's another story. And listen, sometimes this does happen. This is where you might get into Jesus's words in Matthew 18. And yes, that is used in church discipline. But you know what? We can, we can fix our problems long before it ever gets to that. So we should always reconcile with those that we are at odds with. So uh, just because someone is a fellow believer, and I think we need to be uh, realistic about this, just because someone is a believer in Christ and you're a believer in Christ, you don't necessarily have to be their best friend. Because okay? again, that's not going to happen, but we have to be kind towards them. Don't speak evil of them. If there's a problem, hey, try to fix it. Try to fix it. Treat them how you would want them to treat you. It's not always easy, but with God, all things are possible. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So we should live in harmony with all people. And we should not show partiality. Uh, we shouldn't treat someone differently because they are less fortunate than we are. Uh, we shouldn't treat someone differently because they have more or less money because they have more or less education. And you know that's the way the world works. Well, I don't want to associate with that person because of whatever it is. Sometimes it's looks. You know, you'll, you'll, people judge others on how they look or their ethnicity or social status. You know, we should not be too high-minded to think that we are too good for other people or walking around thinking we know it all because nobody knows it all. So verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Many of these teachings, of course, sound very similar to what Jesus said. Both Jesus and Paul uh, seem to address this issue of repay no one evil for evil. Again, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you have heard that it was said of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist the evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. That's not exactly the most popular teaching of Christ. But what's he trying to say there? See, the issue was the Jews were turning that statement, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, into an excuse to take vengeance on other people. But that wasn't the point of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What was the point? Well, it was to protect society. Uh, the idea is the punishment should fit the crime. And you think of some extremist groups in the Middle East. If you go and steal something, what do they do? chop your hand off. I mean, that does, that does actually take place. Uh, that's not the punishment fitting the crime. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Even in our system of government, thieves, what do they do? What does a thief, uh, a thief do? They, they get a fine, right? They get a fine. They maybe go to jail. How about paying back what you stole? How about paying back what you stole and then some? See, that's the punishment that fits the crime. So the purpose of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was to protect other people. It was never meant to 
uh, excuse uh, taking a vengeance. Remember, uh, chapter 12 starts out in verse 2 by saying, do not be conformed to this world. And we know how the world often responds to these types of situations. Say, hey, she did this to me, I'm going to do it right back. You know, he, he said this, I'm going to shoot right back at him. That's the way people, it's natural, really. So a measured response or turning the other cheek, again, it doesn't really come naturally. Uh, verse 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, realistically, this is not possible, okay? It is not possible to live at peace with all men for the simple reason you can't control other people's behavior. All you can do is control your own behavior. You do what you can, and if they don't respond, don't take vengeance, don't repay evil for evil, but sometimes we face those situations where we just can't control what the other person says or does. What's our response? Again, to love them, to care for them, to desire the best for them, to pray for them. We should not worry and get frustrated about things we cannot control. You can't do anything about it. It's not going to do any good. So focus on those things that you can help. Focus on those situations that you can change. Verse 19, in keeping with this whole subject, he says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. And he's talking about God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You think about in the Psalms, David many times wrote because he was taking comfort. And David had his ups and his downs, but many times he took comfort in the idea that God was going to take care of his enemies. You think about King Saul. King Saul was David's enemy. David was justified. He didn't do anything wrong. Saul was clearly the bad guy in that situation. I think most people would agree with that. But do you remember there were a few times where David had the opportunity to kill Saul. And based on what Saul was doing, you say, well, Saul kind of deserved it. But David, he would not do it. And God rewarded him for that. God blessed him for that. God will bless you when you don't take it into your own hands. So eventually God, he took care of Saul. And if you are justified and your personal enemies persist, I think we have every reason in the world to say, Lord, you handle them. You handle them. I hope they change. I'm going to pray that they change. But if they don't, Lord, you take care of them. I think we can do that. Let God handle your enemies. But in the meantime, verse 20, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And there's all sorts of different explanations about what that means. Where did this where did this term come from? But I think it simply means when you respond harshly to someone, that usually makes the situation a whole lot worse. So if you respond with kindness, that might surprise them. And it might actually cause them to feel guilty about how they are acting. And they might change. Hopefully they will change. So this is how we are supposed to live. So let's work to apply these things today, tomorrow, and in the weeks to come. Let it become a lifestyle. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Oh,